the violent powers that destroyed Zoroastrianism in Persia within 15 years and converted ancient Babylonia and Egypt in just four years, also arrived to convert all in India. But even after 1,300 years, India has not been fully converted till today. The question arises, how did the Hindus escape this? A reason often given for survival of the Hindu culture is that Muslim rulers were tolerant towards them. Volumes of documents written by the Muslim historians of that time give eyewitness accounts of Hindu massacres and the destruction of their civilization. The accounts of European travelers and the ruins of thousands of archaeological sites confirm these facts. A well-known Muslim who is called tuti e hind voice of Hind, Amir Khosro, had desired to destroy Hindus in the land of Hindustan. There were brave warriors in Persia and Babylonia who wanted to save their ancient civilization. Warriors were also there among the pagans of Europe, but none could save their civilization. Islam destroyed yeah. the civilization in Persia. The Byzantine and the Sassanid empires were also Syria, Egypt, every place. In fact, India, they took the longest to conquer. They Within 100 years of the death of Muhammad, the Arabs had established an empire that extended over parts of Europe, the entire Central Asia, Egypt, Iran, Syria, Iraq, within 100 years. And it took them 75 years to conquer just Sindh. And from the time that they started foraying into this area and they went to Kabul Valley, etc., it took 400 years for them to establish a foothold in Punjab. When the Delhi Sultanate was established in 1206, for the first hundred years, they could not add an inch of territory to what Muhammad Ghori had added because the resistance was so much. Resistance. The tremendous resistance and self-defense for the longest period in world history was drawn from the power of yoga. There is no power like Yog and no knowledge like Sankhya. This verse is in the text of war, the Mahabharata. In the middle of the battlefield, Krishna declared that Atma cannot be cut by the power of the sword. The Atma is immortal and the body will perish anyway. The one who knows this becomes absolutely fearless. Death cannot defeat him. No one can frighten him. Instead, all are fearful of him. These warriors wearing saffron colors would rush into the battlefield and shed their bodies like torn clothes. Their mental state could belittle the renunciation of ascetics. The self-defense of these valiant warriors continue to defeat the invaders for many centuries. They recaptured their defeated forts. But along with this, millions of common people were also killed. Thousands of brave women chose to sacrifice themselves to the burning fire of Johar to escape horrors at the hands of attackers. In the north, when the resources of the Rajputs were exhausted, they had to compromise with the attackers. But in the south, a powerful empire, Vijayanagar, was born and flourished for a long time. When it was defeated, jointly by five Muslim rulers of the south, Maratha forces emerged in the Deccan. Their empire extended from the south up to Delhi. When the British were establishing their empire in India, it was not the Mughals, but the Marathas with whom they were fighting for dominance. Whatever ancient Indian culture we see in India today is also because of the protection given by the Marathas. Many times, the northern part of India was brought under the rule of Afghanistan or Iran. It was the Sikh Empire that brought back the lost parts of India. 
These wars were not for wealth, power or land, but an attempt to protect the modern, yet very ancient Shastras, the scriptures of meditation. The continuity of Indian culture is indebted to the shrine of weapons that were wielded to protect the Shastras. In India, civilization continued unbroken because it was founded on the pillars of both the Shastra and the Shastra. Tradition says that Narayan the Supreme meditates and Narada the warrior fights war to protect him. Acharya Shankar established the Dashnami Sangh, ten orders of sadhus, having two branches each, the Shastradhari, holder of spiritual texts, and Shastradhari, the warriors. Among these, the largest organization was that of the Ramanandi sect. Through Shastra and Shastra, both these sects contributed greatly in protecting India. The temple of Somnath had thousands of devotees worshipping in the belief that their god will protect them. But Ghaznavi slaughtered them in thousands. The nation was shocked and people were deeply depressed. It was the Ramanandis who reminded them from the Shastra that which comes out from the whole is whole. The devotees, the Bhakts were not helpless. They were no less than Bhagwan, the Divine. Bhakts have saved Bhagwans. Bhakts are an ocean of knowledge, virtues and of incredible strength. Ram is truth incarnate, therefore Ram is Bharat. Such dedicated bhakts have saved Bharat. A bhakt does not think, what can Bharat do for me? He always thinks, what can he do for Bharat? Citizens of the modern world get inspiration from bhakts like this. Indians believe that Hanuman never died, instead, he lives on, invisibly. In the villages of India today, there is a popular saying, Jai Bajrangbali, Thor Dushman Ki Nali. Victory to Hanuman, break the bones of the enemy. The Turks had brought the team of Chalisa, 40 brave fighters to enslave India. This Bhakt wrote his own Chalisa, 40 verses in glory of this Bhakt that motivated Indians to fight back. The Turks used to break idols, the Hindus used to create Bajrang Bali by putting vermilion on the broken pieces. Without Bhakti, India could not have been saved from great despair in medieval times. In 1585, Bhakt Nabadas wrote a text on Bhakti called Bhaktmal, meaning Garland of Bhakts. The Bhakt who is considered the highest jewel by Nabadas is Tulsidas. Historian Vincent Smith has written a biography of Tulsidas. He says, Tulsidas, a contemporary of Akbar, was the greatest man of his age in India, even greater than Akbar himself. Indologist and linguist Sir George Grierson called Tulsidas the greatest leader of the people after the Buddha. Hindi writer Hazari Prasad Dvivedi wrote that Tulsidas established a sovereign rule of the kingdom of Dharma in northern India. Author Edmo Babinu says, that if Tulsidas was born in Europe or the Americas, he would be considered a greater person than William Shakespeare. Surikant Sripati, Nirala, considered Tulsidas a greater poet than Rabindranath Tagore and in the same league as Kalidas, Vyas and Valmiki. Ernest Wood considered the Ram Charitmanas superior to the best books of Latin and Greek languages. And what a wonder 
that illiterate village folks of North India have been memorizing it for generations. Renowned poetess Mahadevi Verma said, India in the days of darkness was shown light by the seers and poets. When the swords were silenced and the blowing of conch shells faded, the water in the Kamandal of Tulsi never dried. Today we do not know the Ram of antiquity, but we know the Ram of Tulsi. Indian society as it exists today is an edifice built by Tulsi Das. Long before Maharaja Ranjit Singh or the Marathas, the teachings of the Mahabharat and Ramayan were protecting India. Babur, the Turk, was an invader of India. Babur was inspired by his ancestor, Tamur, and attacked India and became the ruler of Delhi. His grandson, Akbar, was liberal in his religious approach, but he was always proud of his Tamurian ancestry. He declared himself a Ghazi by beheading a Hindu king, Hemachandra Vikramaditya of Delhi, and was proud of it all his life. Earlier, his father Humayun had been thrown out of India by the Afghan, Sher Shah Suri. To counter the Afghan, Akbar forged a friendship with the Rajputs and presented himself as a liberal towards the Hindus. He abolished the discriminatory jazia tax and the pilgrimage tax on Hindus. These liberal gestures helped curtail the further destruction of India. And India regained much of her economic prosperity. Jahangir, the son of Akbar, resumed the policy of forced conversion of Hindus. Many of the Delhi sultans used to ill-treat their Indian subjects. They would attack and capture them and sell them in slave markets. Every slave had to embrace Islam. To escape conversion, many moved to take refuge in the thick jungles. Who were these people? Historian Professor K. S. Lal writes that today, all the scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other backward classes combined make up 50% of India's population. This staggering high figure has been reached because of historical forces operating in the medieval times primarily. Muslim rule spread all over the country. Resistance to it by the Hindus also remained widespread. Jungles abound throughout the vast land, from Gujarat to Bengal, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, and flight into them was the safest safeguard. According to him, this is how scheduled caste and scheduled tribe people are found in every state. During the medieval period, they lived almost like wild beasts in improvised huts in forest villages, segregated and isolated, suffering and struggling. Now let us compare Muslim rulers with the Hindu kings. Most Islamic rulers forcibly converted Hindus, demolished temples and turned them into mosques. Women were tortured and sent to their harems. Hindu farmers were sold as slaves. On the other hand, Hindu kings were very different. Rana Pratap and Chhatrapati Shivaji treated Muslim women with respect, like their sisters and daughters, when they won the territories of Muslim rulers. They respected copies of the Quran and abstained from demolishing mosques. They never believed in conversion, never captured enemy soldiers to make them slaves, always believed in diversity. This is called Sanskriti, culture. To save this Sanskriti, those who once had to eat roti made of grass with the Bheel tribals were protectors of the universal values of freedom of religion. With these universal values, Indian Sanskriti is made, and a better world is made. Babur once wrote, in India, foreign invaders plunder village after village, kill people, but just in a few years, the same villages flourish again in full bloom. Reverberating with song, dance and festive celebrations, how is this possible? Someone should have told him, you can kill only the perishable body. The Atma is indestructible. People come again in their new bodies. How can Kaal annihilate the civilization that was started by none other than the Mahakal?
Here, Adi Yogi crushes death under his feet with his Tandav dance. This is the Sanskriti of Hindus who celebrate both life and death. There are more festivals than the 365 days of the year. For Indians, Bharat is not only the land of dharma. This is the land of Ras Leela, blissful celebrations of the yogis. It is all because of their philosophy of life that the Indians were saved from falling into despair in spite of centuries of marauding invasions. The celebrations of Kalpataru, the wish-fulfilling tree of civilization, have lived on forever. Indian society, which was industry-based from the times of the Indus Valley Civilization, became poor within a hundred years of British rule and became agriculture-based. During famines, one-third of the population perished. In spite of this, the revenue of the British East India Company increased manifold. From where did the farmers pay their taxes? <laughs> 